every Friday since 2004, before San Francisco's annual Pride event, transgender people from all over the globe gather in Dolores Park to bring home the message that we deserve safety, love, and empowerment. However, the existence of Trans March is but a signifier of hope in an otherwise dark history. Hundreds of years before companies would adopt rainbow merchandise every June to entice their liberal consumers, the United States threw queer people to the shadows. From the inception of the United States, transgender people have been over-policed, and our stories have been misrepresented or erased entirely. Despite this, our existence has not wavered. Some of America's greatest heroes are absent in our classrooms and historical texts. Darling, I want my gay rights now! I think it's about time the gay brothers and sisters got their rights, and especially the women! So many names have been lost in the systemic erasure of our community, but our history is still unfolding. There is a phenomenon of misremembering that happens in these social movements, as if what is happening right now is inherently different from what has brought us liberation in the past. This is not an accident. Perhaps the most famous instance we can reference happened 50 years ago. Being queer was regarded as an underground culture for night dwellers, a place for the morally bankrupt sexual deviant. The United States had seen the beginnings of a sexual liberation movement in the 20s. This was squandered by the Great Depression and war as cultural ties began to reward adhering to the nuclear family, a white suburban household with 2.5 kids and a white picket fence. Under the guise of good American values, anything that didn't fit this conformity was directly seen as a communist threat. This gave way to the American sentiment that queerness was a mental disorder or a spiritual malady. However, within these cultures, a very different narrative was told. There were drag shows, dance parties, poetry and art. Many communities took care of children who had been kicked out of their homes for being queer. It was clear this was a place of cultural renaissance and radical love rather than heretical rampage. Come to the 1950s and 60s, the power was supposed to be with the people and many were tired of the conformist attitudes. Uh, when Aston tried to get a job as a woman, Yes. This doesn't work. You get a job, you work for a day or two, a week, a month, or whatever it boils down. Somebody comes along that recognizes you. Queer individuals were no different. They had become fed up with the harsh police regulations on gender expression, along with the dangers of living in a transphobic and homophobic society. People were tired, and eventually there would be uprisings that erupted throughout the country in favor of change, namely the Cooper Donuts riots of LA, the Compton Cafeteria riots of San Francisco, and the Stonewall riots in New York City. These uprisings were violent protests against police, primarily led by trans women of color, who were often the largest targets of police violence against queer people. Queer liberation found a new home in the eyes of legislation and media. Progress was being made, Activists like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera started organizations like Gay Liberation Front and STAR, STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Both were the dream of a future where queer people could safely live their lives. Unfortunately, this isn't what happened. As the gay liberation movement picked up steam, it began to exclude the very people who had given it life. White cis gay men became the new face of gay liberation and transgender women of color again were cast to the shadows. Not much changed for those who had given birth to this beautiful movement. I've been trying to get up here all day for your gay brothers and your gay sisters in jail that write me every motherfucking week. The queer narrative became a split one. One side of our community was fighting in legislation, media, representation, and public opinion. Another side of our community was being murdered with no justice and no seat at the table. While there are many more details in our transgender history, the story of Trans March begins when a yearly picnic erupted into a protest. All right, when I say tranny, you say picnic, all right? <laughs> Let's make it really loud so all these people that are barely dressed up there that think we're all freaks can hear us. 
Gwen Amber Rose Araujo was an American Latina teenager whose life was cut short by four men when they discovered that she was transgender. To lessen their charges, the defendants used the trans panic defense, legitimizing transphobia in the courtroom. Unfortunately, this story was all too common. On the heels of pride, the community in San Francisco decided we would not stand for another LGB event, and we were tired of our own events being cast to the side for other pride celebrations. We deserve to be recognized, empowered, and safe. An email thread went around to local activists asking for organizing traction to ignite a protest at a yearly picnic celebrating the transgender community that had started two years earlier at Dolores Park. On the evening of Friday, June 26, 2004, Trans March as we know it began, a protest to make our injustices heard. My name is Cecilia Chang. I'm a community advocate. The first year of Trans March, the way it got started was really a group of us getting together to plan the trans altar in the Civic Center. And at the time, we heard about a mysterious flyer that was circling around the community telling people to show up on Friday at Dolores Park, but nobody would step up and take ownership of it. And because of that, um, we decided that we need to be a little bit more organized because we don't want that to turn into something that could be unsafe potentially. My name is Luis Gutierrez Mock. So I was very insignificantly involved in the very first Trans March. It started for many different reasons. Um, it was around the same time that the mistrial occurred in Gwen Arajo's murder case, and some people had started circulating an anonymous email trying to get a Trans March to happen in San Francisco, and those two events sort of coincided with each other. And I attended the first event in 2004, and it was it was really powerful. It was it was really beautiful. Um, just seeing the way that community came together, and there was definitely a lot of people carrying her in our hearts, and really thinking about how, as a community, can we respond to the intense amounts of transphobic hate violence that particularly transgender women of color face, um, not only in San Francisco, but you know, really throughout the U.S. and the, and the world. Hi, I'm Janelle Lester. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am program associate for the Transgender District. Going to San Francisco Pride, I feel like I would experience a lot of transphobia. Lots of cis straight people would um, be at those events, and being there, they would call you names and all of those things, and Pride being something that is supposed to be a safe space for us, um, I stopped going. Um, and so Trans March, once I found out about Trans March, it was like, oh, I'm gonna go to this um, and skip Pride. Though we have come so far in gaining our liberation, it has not been enough. And there are many issues our community still struggles to address. I will not be in spaces that I don't feel welcome in. Um, and personally, I don't feel like Pride is welcoming in that way. What's up? My name's Yanni. Um, I identify as non-binary. I have they them pronouns. Um, 28, I'm a Taurus, triple Taurus. I'm from Oakland, California. I think that the community needs to remember um, the history of this country and what black people have been through outside of being queer or being trans. Uh, I think that a lot of people in the queer community forget that because they're marginalized as well. And they want to equate the two and they're not equal. It's not, it's not the same. So I think ways in which the community could help us is listening to us, listening to our stories, um, wanting to actually hear what we have to say and not be so quick to respond, but, but have an ear because they want to, they want to learn. They want to, they want to elevate our experiences, elevate what it is that we've gone through and help us move to the next level. Use your privilege to, to push the, the, our black community that is here because not, we're not just dealing with being queer. We're dealing with being black, you know, and racism is a, a, a form of trauma that we have to deal with every day, you know? So I think that to our other community members, love on us, you know, stop being so scared or afraid of us. Like we're, we want to just love and be and exist in this world just the same way that you do. I came, became involved with the Trans March in 2009, uh, mostly because I really loved the event and I was a little unsatisfied with 
um, sort of the diversity of the attendees at the event. And so I joined in order to increase the participation by transgender people of color and trans women. There were a lot of challenges that happened when the Trans March decided to try to work to increase the diversity of the event itself. First, I think, was getting other people on the steering committee to see how the steering committee itself can directly impact who attends and the way that outreach is conducted, things like who is invited to be on the stage. All of that really affects um, who feels comfortable attending the event. And there were also, I think, some, some um, bridges burned within communities that had to be repaired and definitely a lot of community mobilization had to occur in order to help people feel safe and help people feel like it was their event again and that it, the Trans March really was an, an inclusive space for trans people of color, for trans women, and really for everyone in the trans community and our allies. My name is Rexy, or the one and only Rexy. I am 23. Um, I am a drag performer here in San Francisco as well as a community advocate. I've been a part of organizing ever since I first came out when I was in middle school. I was undocumented for a large portion of my life up until very recently. And I've been um, in different capacities been involved with Trans March. As a Trans Latina, I've had to prove myself in different spaces. I've had to prove that even though English is not my first language, my words just have just as much of a meaning and importance and value as the words of those who are whose first language is English. Being able to be a part of Trans March um, while growing up really helped me with my discovery of my trans identity and my gender discovery and my gender journey. There are many reasons why I think people should support Trans March. I think the most important one is because we have been holding the Transgender Day of Remembrance for years, remembering our dead, but we really don't have a space to celebrate the living. Well, the Trans March for me is a coming together of our communities the transgender community, all the different segments, you know, it's a movement. I think that we try to be visible out there. Um, it's a very important, important uh, gathering because we unite as, as one. Trans March has definitely been very supportive um, of my career. And so last year, me and the co Spring Collins were able to get on stage and talk about transcend. I have been coming to Trans March for so long and they have always asked me to get on stage and I was like, no. Um, but last year was the opportunity for me to get up there and like really take charge and speak about trans and influx. Identifying so proud trans Latina. Um, before I only had access to transness that was white. Um, and I had never actually met a trans Latina. Um, it was um, through Trans March um, and through um, my um, queer parents, queer familia, that I was able to see that transness could be anyone. It didn't have to be just white, a white identity, but it could be for POC folks and it could be for um, anyone who identifies with it. I was newly starting to identify as trans um, and also just being there and seeing all these other people living for the same purpose and just loving on themselves was pretty magical and powerful to me. I'm like the most happiest I've ever been in my life and I think that being black and being trans has a lot to do with, <laughs> with all of it. <laughs> the most powerful thing we can do as transgender people is continue living our lives joyously. Last year at the Queen Culture, um, retreat. When we went to Hawaii, there was 10 Black trans women. And this is the first time that any of us had been on a vacation. Um, and one of the days, we were there for like six days. It was a sponsored trip. All we had to pay was $75. And there was one of these days where the girls were just tired and my boss, Aria Saeed, came and was like, uh-uh, y'all need to get up. We need to go to the beach. Um, and we were like, to the beach? Like, where do you want us to put on bathing suits to go to the beach? None of us had done that, but we did it and we went to the beach and 
all of us were like playing in the water and running on the sand and talking to all the other people. And it was something that none of us had did or had done where we lived, like back home. And so after then, it was like really great being there and seeing all of us. Cultivating Joy was the name of the retreat. And it was really joy joyous. I love how ambiguous I am. And that's not even just a physical thing. It can be sometimes. I do get misgendered a lot. I get I get she, her, ma'am, him, sir. Oh, I get everything, you know? And then some people will randomly say they because they don't know what my gender is, which I love because I'm like, okay, thank you for at least acknowledging that you weren't sure and you went with a, <laughs> a neutral uh, pronoun, which, you know, I feel seen in those moments, you know? But just inside of me, internally, I, I I feel so ambiguous, just my energy, my entity, like who I am, I just feel I'm everything. And for me, that that is everything. Our mere existence is proof of a better future to come. And to remember that our greatest strength is a diversity of experience when we work towards a common future goal. We realize it's not just about here, San Francisco is organizing another transgender event, but we're really showing the world out there that anything is possible, that in San Francisco, there is a community that's there to celebrate everything that we have achieved and also continue to voice everything that we need to voice. We, no less than those we study, are actors in history, making choices that affect the lives of others. Valerie J. Matsumoto.